Buying a home is every person's dream. Choosing whether to buy or rent a home is a big decision that can have big effect on your finances, lifestyle, and goals. Depending on your lifestyle and financial situation, you can select any of the options. Both options need a consistent source of income and some maintenance work. There are several differences that make renting and owning property different. Renting doesn't come with the responsibilities associated with home ownership. Buying a house is a sizable investment, but it does come with a big cost, upfront and in the long run. The common perception is that if you can purchase a home with a mortgage payment that is equal to or less than what you would otherwise pay in rent, then buying is a good decision. This way of thinking is extremely flawed. Owning a home isn't always better than renting, and renting is not as simple as it seems. To figure out if it's better to rent or buy, we need to compare the total cost of renting and the total cost of owning that can't be recouped. This may sound complicated, but don't worry, we will boil it down to a simple explanation. According to the United States Census Bureau, the national home ownership rate in the first quarter of 2022 was 65.4%, which means that two-thirds of the population are homeowners. Over the past two years, the other thirds of the population have been racing to buy a home themselves, motivated by the low mortgage rates and competition. Before we get into the 5% rule, we need to lay out the assumptions that came with it. An unrecoverable cost is a cost that you pay with no associated residual value. When we talk about the unrecoverable cost of renting, it is easy because it is just the amount that you're paying in rent. For a homeowner, the unrecoverable cost is a bit harder to pin down. A homeowner has a mortgage payment. It is similar to rent, but it is not meaningful comparison. A mortgage is not an unrecoverable cost. It is a combination of interest and principal repayment. The costs that a homeowner can get back are property taxes, repair costs, and the cost of capital. It is these costs that we need to compare to rent. Property taxes are a pretty easy topic that people can grasp. You pay the taxes to own your home, and there is no residual value. Property taxes are generally 1% of the value of the home, and that is the first piece of the magic 5% rule. Even with interest rates rising and the overheated market finally cooling, housing prices remain high. Countless individuals who cannot afford those inflated prices are choosing to wait out the market. But rents are also skyrocketing in the country. What to do? Both renting and buying have important pros and cons that you should think about before making a choice. So here are the pros of buying property. First, equity buildup. As you make mortgage payments, you make equity in the property, which you can use later as a source of financial security. Second, long-term stability. When you buy property, you have the security of knowing that you have a permanent place to live and won't have to worry about rent increases or losing your home. Third, potential appreciation. The value of your property can increase over time, providing you with financial return on your investment. On the other hand, here are the cons of buying property. First, upfront costs. Buying property requires significant upfront investment, including a down payment, closing costs, and other expenses. Second, maintenance and repair costs. As a homeowner, you are responsible for maintaining and repairing the property, which can be costly. Third, responsibility for property taxes. As a homeowner, you are responsible for paying property taxes, which can be substantial. Here are also the pros of renting a property. First, flexibility. Renting provides more flexibility in terms of where and when you live, as you are not tied to a particular property. Second, lower upfront cost. Rent requires much less upfront investment compared to buying property. 
Third, no maintenance or repair responsibilities. When you rent a property, the landlord is responsible for maintenance and repairs, not you. And the cons of renting a property include, first, no equity buildup. When you rent a property, you do not build or have a financial investment in the property. Second, rent increases. Rent can increase over time, making it more expensive to continue to live in the same place. Third, limited freedom to renovate and decorate. When you rent a property, you may be limited in terms of the changes you can make to the property. We have to think about the maintenance costs. Maintenance costs cover a huge range of expenses. It can be large items like replacing the roof or renovating the kitchen to maintain the value of the home. However, it can also be the little things like redoing the bathroom. Pinning down the right number to estimate maintenance costs is not easy. Average maintenance costs are not easily accessible, but most people suggest using 1% of the property value on average. This is the second piece of the 5% rule. Finally, the last and most important piece of the 5% rule is the cost of capital. This on a recoverable cost has to be broken down into two components the cost of debt and the cost of equity. Most homeowners finance the purchase of their home with a mortgage. Let's use a new homeowner as an example. Let's say that they put down 20% and finance the remaining 80% with a mortgage. Interest will be charged on the 80% that has been paid for with a mortgage. Back in April 2019, we could easily find mortgages for just under and just above 3% on the interest. The 3% mortgage interest will be our non-recoverable cost. Up until this point, we thought that all the inputs to the 5% rule were highly intuitive when it came to maintenance costs, property taxes, and mortgage interest. This is the last. The cost of equity capital is a bit less intuitive and it requires digging into some data. In our example for the mortgage, we put 20% down. On that 20%, there's a cost of equity capital. When you put 20% down, you are making a choice to invest in a real estate asset. Alternatively, you could have continued renting and invested the down payment money in stocks. It is that alternative that creates an opportunity cost, which is a real economic cost incurred by a homeowner. To estimate this cost, we need to come up with an estimate for expected returns, both for real estate and for stocks. A good place to start is with historical data. Looking at the Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns Yearbook 2018, we can get an idea of the data going back to the 1900s. Globally, the real return on the estate, that is, net inflation, from 1900 through 2017 was 1.3%, while stocks returned 5.2% after inflation. If we assume inflation at 1.7%, then we will be thinking about a 3% nominal return for real estate and a 6.9% nominal return for stocks. Many have mentioned that 3% might work for global real estate, but not their area since it is way too low for them, and you think it should be closer to 5 or 10%. Let's clear that up right now. The problem with this thinking for any asset class is that markets price assets based on the information that is available at the time. You would never sell your house for $500,000 if you knew that the buyer would resell it a year later for $550,000. If you knew, you wouldn't sell it for $500,000. We can't assume that the high recent historical returns we've seen will continue indefinitely. That is not a sensible way to make a decision. Instead, we can look at the risk premium that the market has placed on those types of assets over time and use that as an estimate for the future. That 6.9% historical return for stocks includes Russia's and China's stock markets going to zero. It also includes the aftermath of wars around the world. If we were to cherry pick, say, US stocks, 
the argument for stocks becomes a whole lot stronger. But that doesn't make any sense at all. That was a bit of discretion, and I think it was important to put it out there. We did not use the historical return on stocks as an estimate for future returns. We use a combination of the 50-year historical return and the current expected return based on the price-earnings ratio. As a result, when prices are high, as they have been recently, our expected returns are lower. Our current nominal return for a 100% equity portfolio is 6.57%. That is quite lower than the historical average. If we take these numbers as they are, 3% for real estate and 6.57% for stocks, we would have an unexpected return difference between real estate and stocks. To keep it simple and conservative, we think that we can round that down to 3% and we now have the cost of equity capital of 3% which is conveniently equal to the cost of debt capital. No matter how you finance your home, the cost of capital is 3%. We now have a total of 5% of the value of the home that you would expect to pay in unrecoverable costs. Do not forget that rent is an unrecoverable cost that is easy to see, but the unrecoverable cost of being a homeowner is harder. The 5% rule can be used to think about the unrecoverable cost of renting and owning on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. We think that this kind of thinking can be used as a quick reference for anyone considering the financial aspect of their rent versus buy decision. Ultimately, deciding between renting and buying a home is a personal choice. If you haven't yet made your decision, it may be helpful to speak with a professional who can help you weigh your options and make informed decisions. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with the people whom you think can benefit from it. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for more of our content. Thank you for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.